We've been on a, uh, started a series on faith, a, a uh, lifetime lifestyle. We're beginning the new year, and some of you may try to make some lifestyle changes yourself. You set up a plan. Some of you may want to read through the Bible in uh, the entire Bible this year. You have to have a plan for that. There's many plans for it. Some, some plans start with uh, a, a book, reading through a, straight through a book of the Bible and sticking with that. Other plans jump from, from book to book and verses to verses. And if, if you follow that plan, it takes you through the whole Bible. I prefer myself to read through books of the Bible so that I can see the flow and understand how how history folds out, folded out in, in, the, in the Bible. It helps me understand how that fits together. But you have other lifestyle changes. Some of you may want to clean up the clutter in your house. So you set up a plan to go from, from uh, a closet to closet, uh, room to room, possibly. Uh, Sharon, Sharon uh, Chafee, okay, when she came here, she says, uh, I'd like to do something. I said, well, why don't we clean up the rooms downstairs. They were all in clutter, and so she started with a plan. You had to you said, well, here's one room I don't want to tackle first. <laughs> uh, you know? So, and it's, and, it's, uh, and it's a process that you go through. You Sometimes you pick a plan that, that you know well, works well for you at the time. Uh, I do a similar thing. I get something that's easy, to do to begin with on a project and then I get try to get the hardest thing in the middle possibly at times and then ease off at the very end. Uh, Janie and I are in the process, we've been lived in our house for over 30 years so we're in the process of trying to do some remodeling inside and if we were to look at the the the, the all the dust all the things that we'd have to go through and focus on that, it would, it, it's very discouraging. We have to look at the end product. What is this room going to look like? What is this bathroom going to look like when we finish? And that's my plan. Because I look at the finish line a lot of times. And I, I focus on the, on the project in the middle and getting things, but, but my, my, my mind is on the, the finish line. Uh, we have to do that at times, not to get discouraged. But we are in a, a, a study called the Faith, a Lifetime Lifestyle. And you have to make it a lifestyle. And it's for a lifetime. Because as we are faced with different trials in our life, uh, we can become bogged down. Some trials that we are faced with last longer than the others. Some trials may last a lifetime that we have. I have a, my definition, and I have encouraged you to get a definition for you of a faith and lifetime lifestyle. Mine is daily trusting and implementing the biblical understanding of who God is by knowing his character and the promises he has made to us as his children. I would encourage you to learn the attributes of God so that when you read scripture, your, these attributes are jumping out at you. Did you see, uh, this, is, this is God, he's showing his omnipotence, his power. He's showing his omniscience, that he knows everything. Uh, that he knows everything about his past, present, and future. We can't, he can't be fooled by what's, what, uh, or surprised. He's not fooled or surprised by what happens to us or what happens in the world. Then we look at uh, his, his promises, the promises to his children. We see that he gives eternal life. He promises eternal life the moment we trust in his son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. He will never leave or, or, or desert us or forsake us. He is, when we are faithless, he remains faithful. He provides all of our needs. Those are his promises. And then through those, we, we took a look at that we need to implement a plan to... to, to uh, uh, put it in, put it into practice. Do you have a plan in your life where your faith will increase because of your plan? Do you have a certain plan or do you just kind of have haphazardly uh, uh, respond to things that happen to you? Do you actually have something that you say, I know that 
I need to be doing this to prepare me for the future. We need a plan. So that when we're, we're faced with dirt and certain things in our life, that we're ready for that. And are you, are you actually having a plan now that you can, that you can uh, build upon for when you do face some difficulties in your life? We looked last week at King David, and King David was faced with his family uh, being taken hostage, uh, captives, and all of his belongings, his children, his wives, and the, his own men, people at the time, wanted the stone. And the scripture says, and David strengthened himself in the Lord. And then we looked at, at, at what does it mean to strengthen yourself in the Lord? And we look back in, in David's life when he faced Goliath. And, and he was brought before the king Samuel. And, and uh, he says, hey, I'll go fight Goliath. And, and Samuel says, no, you're, you're just a boy. You're not trained. And then King David reflected upon God's faithfulness in his past. He says, you know, when I was a shepherd, there was bears, there were lions that came and tried to kill the sheep. And I went out, and God helped me to kill the bears and the lions. The same God that helped me kill the bear and the lion will help me prevail over this Philistine. So David looked, he remembered God's faithfulness in his past. He believed God's power and his promise. He went and faced Goliath, and he said, Goliath said, hey, you know, you're going to die today. And David said, no, you come with me with sword and spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord, the God of, of the nation of Israel. He saw God's guidance. We see him and saw him pray and ask God for, for guidance when he was, after his family was called and after he cried and the people wanted to stone him, he, he saw God's guidance. And God answered him. And then he, he went out and, and, and applied that. So we want to see our faith grow. And root systems are interesting. In a tree, in, in North America, most of the North American trees, they do have very shallow tap roots. The, the largest uh, white oak has a tap root around four feet deep. Most of their root systems grow along the surface. Because we have plenty of water. Uh, the, the sweet gum has one of the longest, deepest tap roots, and it goes around 10 to 14 feet. Not very deep. It's interesting that the shepherd's tree, which is found in the Kalahari Desert, is... is growing in drier areas of the southern Africa is often referred to as the tree of life because nearly every part of the tree can be used or eaten by humans or animals. It's called shepherd's tree because it's one of the few trees where you can hide and find, find a relief uh, from the sun. But the interesting about the shepherd's tree in this droughted area, it has the deepest documented roots, roots that extend more than 230 feet. And it's because of the dryness there, the roots are going down deeper. When we're living in a, and we live in a in an area in our lives that where we have, we're, we're pretty comfortable, aren't we? And it, it can stun our growth if we do not purposely try to increase our faith. This morning we're going to look at trials. That they are a blessing. We see that in Scripture. You say, trials are a blessing. How, how does that happen? Uh, I do not look at my trials normally and say, you know, immediately say, oh, great, i got a trial. <laughs> this is wonderful. We're probably programmed to not enjoy pain. We want immediate relief. And, and our world has provided us many release away from these difficulties that we're, we face with a lot of times. But let's take a look at James. When we're, when the background of James is James is the half-brother of Jesus. Now I've talked with Bob, and Bob's done some study on this, and he, he, he does, he go there. But, but for purposes of understanding, you can talk with Bob later while that's not the case. But 
but we'll we'll uh, we'll look for the purpose of this morning. We'll look at him as half brother of Jesus. Uh, the book of James was probably written between 45 and 49 A.D. after the persecution of Stephen in Acts 7 and after Paul's persecution of the church in Acts 8 and 9. James, the book of James, is written, he is writing to Jewish believers, the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. And if you look and read through the book of James, you start seeing that he addresses these, these uh, believers as brethren, 12 times, and his beloved brethren, three times. He also says, our God and Father, uh, our glorious Lord uh, Jesus Christ. With it, the tongue, we bless our Lord and, and Father, so that we would be, we would be the kind of first fruits among the, his creatures. So we see that he's writing to believers. It's important that when we're studying the book of, of, of Scripture to know who the writer is addressing. And it may change depending upon, you have to look at the context of the passage because there's other passages in Scripture where people are addressed as brethren, but they're addressing unbelievers. One example is in Acts chapter 2. Peter's addressing the, the, uh, the uh, unbelievers there. He even says at the beginning of, of a section of Scripture in 2, he says, men of Israel. So he he establishes their, their unbelievers. But he also calls them brethren, meaning that he, they, were, they were Hebrews, just as he is. So, uh, we have, we, he's writing to believers here. We begin with James chapter 1, verses 1 and 4. It says, James, a bondservant or slave of God. It's interesting that he doesn't say, and half brother of Jesus. <laughs> It doesn't kind of, we would want to probably name drop, wouldn't we? You know? But he is referring to himself as a slave, a slave of God. And the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect results so that you may be perfect and complete. Lacking in nothing. Here's some of my observations. And as you take a look at this, you may see more, and we're going to, I'm going to allow you to share some of those observations that I did not put down. But trials are an opportunity for spiritual growth. If you look at that, God has placed trials in our life as an opportunity for spiritual growth. Trials are unavoidable. Look at that. It says, when you encounter various trials. Not if you encounter various trials. It's when. It's just a matter of time. Trials test our faith. You can see where we are spiritually, how deep our roots of faith are. Trials all will produce endurance, perseverance, and patience if there is a condition there. Because the, God provides the, the trials, but there, we have a responsibility of how we respond to those trials. Biblical endurance produces spiritual maturity. I want you to remember this verse because when we get in chapter 2, it's going to come back and be used again. And, and it's going to resurface here. So remember this. Biblical endurance produces spiritual maturity. Remember the, uh, a 1-4 here. And then lastly, we are spiritual athletes in training, and God is our head coach. We look at it as it, it, a, a uh, uh, Olympic or a trainer, someone in training. We are, God is trying to train us for a purpose, that we would be faithful servants of his. his. So trials are there for that purpose. The NPNG stands for no pain, no gain. We hear that all the time, and, and as you did for trainers, no pain, no gain. Uh, trials can will help us grow. If any other observations from this this passage, anyone else see any other observations? Yes, ma'am. 
You can't be a coach unless unless you've already been training. So how can you help others unless you've reached that level? Very good. You can't be a coach unless you're you've you've already been trained. We don't really spend much time looking at the word perseverance. We are in such an immediate gratification society. So I think it would do us well to really understand perseverance is the long haul. And somebody in training would understand that. But. That's right. That's right. I ran some when I was young. And they say, long distance runners say, there's a, after you get past, past a certain uh, uh, distance, your endorphins kick in the gear. It happens more, I understand, for women than it does for men. Mine never kicked in the gear. <laughs> it was pain all the way. And so I, I shifted to running just a half mile. Uh, because that was a good distance for me. I wasn't fast, and I didn't, my endorphins didn't kick in for those long distances, so I said, oh, let me get this thing over with. Yeah. <laughs> so it was kind of an intermediate speed there. Any other observations? Jim? He was a bond servant. And the difference between a bond servant and just a regular slave is that it was his choice. Mm -hmm. He gave himself to his master. I would love for his master. Great observation. He, the bond servant is his choice. He chose to be a bond servant. Chose to be a bond servant. Anyone else? Well, let's continue on here. Just as the lack of water helps produce the deep roots of the shepherd's tree, trials will help produce deep roots of faith in the believer's life. They'll be there. These, these oak trees, the poplar trees, it doesn't take too much to, uh, a long of a drought for them to start seeing uh, suffering because of it in pine trees. But this shepherd's tree has those deep roots. Approach, our approach to trials will determine the depth of our faith. I have uh, some definition. Trials, uh, in, in James, we see that trials are, they are a temptation to cease trusting and obeying God when our faith is tested. If we look at the book of James, he's trying to prepare us that when we are faced with trials, when we're tested, that we'll be faithful when tested there. We have origins of trials. We have self-inflicted. I uh, I knew a man that uh, bought one of those about years ago. Had to bought a conversion van, real nice, brand new conversion van. He had five children, you know, plush inside. Uh, he was making monthly payments. Five years later, he finished the payments, but not too long after that, his his engine blew up, and. Uh, he took it in, had it towed in, and, and found out he had, didn't have any oil in the engine. He never had an oil change. So he had to get a brand new engine for it. That was a self-inflicted trial. Uh, what are some other self-inflicted trials that you had experienced yourself or you have seen happen to others? Anyone? We had a teenager in our, in our youth group years ago. This is 20, 25, 30 years ago. And he was uh, complaining about his high insurance rates. And back then he was paying $250 a month for uh, just liability on his car. And it was an old car. It was an old car. I says, why don't you change insurance companies? He said, I can't. I said, why? He said, I have too many tickets, speed tickets. <laughs> so he was a self-inflicted problem that he had. And that's what we, we need to understand. Are they, is, my trials that I'm going through, are they self-inflicted? <laughs> or are they people-inflicted? There's, there's people that cause us trials. Uh, if you are, if, if, if someone hits your car and, and hurts you, that's not your problem. I mean, not your fault. Self-inflicted by somebody else. 
or consequences of sin in mankind and the world. Uh, we have the we have some Jerry and I had some friends of ours that lost their home during a hurricane down in Florida. But that's a that's a consequence of sin in the world. Uh, Satan inflicted or God testing us. Then you have examples of trial to persecuted for your Christian beliefs, uh, uh, financial uh, loss of job or income. How about inflation? Inflation is hitting us. Uh, that could be uh, those. I mean, that's in, affecting all of us. Some trials. Some people have more trials, or more difficulty because of that than others. Uh, you have a physical sickness or material trials. Uh, we had our about a year ago our air conditioner went out and they have it replaced. Six thousand dollars later, it's it's it's, it's rough and rotty. But they, it can cause difficulties, those things. So, Dr. Thomas Costable says, Trials are the means that God uses to make believers the kind of people that brings honor to his name. Testing implies demonstrating the true quality of something when undergoing a trial. The true quality of gold becomes evident when the refiner's heat heats gold ore over a fire. The Christian's belief in God's power and promises becomes apparent by the, by the way he or she responds to trials. Trials test our faith in the sense that our trust in God and obedience to God are being stretched to the limit. Endurance describes the quality that enables a person to stay on his or her feet when facing a storm. If we submit to these tests, they will eventually make us more mature, fully developed, perfect, and complete, developed in every essential area of our lives. Perfect refers to a person who fulfills the purpose for which God created him or her. Those who fully attain to their high calling, trials should be produce endurance, steadfastness, perseverance, and maturity in a believer's life. When I look at this, I, 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 I see three categories that are revealed, or three types of Christians that trials reveal. The victim, the arrogant, and the last, the, it should be the learner or, or, and disciple there. Uh, you have someone who's a victim. What are some characteristics of a victim? Somebody else's fault. Uh, what's the problem with being a victim, Lori? They, they don't get past it. They don't. They just wallow in the event. They stay in the event. They never look for help or why me? Why is this happening to me? And let me tell you something. I don't know if you're like me, but I bet I played the victim. I played the arrogant. I've, I've been these 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 people here, and I see myself. And there's there's times when when I go through a trial that I may be playing the victim and say, Gary, this you know this is what you need to do. Or the arrogant, I just I tried to do it on my own. I like to fix things. If something breaks, I'm geared to fix things. I'm wired. I have the tools to do it with. But I need to be careful that this doesn't jump over into my spiritual life either. That I want to fix this. I can do this on my own. I need to realize how weak I am and how powerful God is. What characteristics does the victim Christian or the arrogant Christian display? when faced with trials. Examine your own life. Are there times when you say, I can, uh, uh, you play the victim? Are there times when you, you play the arrogant? I don't need help. Pride. Pride is big, big on that. Pride is big. What was that? Victim displays helplessness. 
Yeah, they had probably a helplessness, or they, why is, it, why is this happening to me? They just wallow in their, their self-pity a lot of times. How has human progress helped produce today's victim Christian or arrogant Christian? How has it helped produce? Credit cards. How has credit cards helped produce? And bring us to the point where we say, we don't need God. You think you can afford things that you really shouldn't be affording because you don't have the money yet. You run up to credit. Yeah, you run up to credit. You're not looking to God to provide. What does what is, uh, Philippians 4.19 say? And my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Frank McNamara went into a restaurant in New York, ate his meal, reached in his pocket, and found out he forgot his wallet. Thankfully, his, he called his wife. She came in and bailed him out. One year later, in 1950, he and his friend walked in back, went back into a restaurant and paid for their meal with the diner's credit card. That was the first credit card that came on service in 1950. He saw a need. He, he, he produced and started a business which has boomed <coughs> tremendously. But before then, people paid with cash. And if they ran out of cash, they ran out. But they would budget. Janie and I had parents that, 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 that grew up and they taught us pay cash, pay cash, pay cash, don't go into that, pay cash. And they did it, they demonstrated. And it was one of the best, one of the most important things practically that they taught us. So when Janie and I got married, we said we're not going to go into debt. We, we did borrow money for a house. But everything else we paid cash for. We did without. We sacrificed. For two years, we took all of our receipts that we for things we bought, and we put them in different categories, and we found out, made a budget from that. We had a, 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 a already a budget, but we got it more defined. Two years, save every receipt that we spent. Formed a budget, and then we used an envelope map. And Janie had different categories, and every month I'd go to the bank, and I'd get out money and bring her cash home. She'd put them in the different envelopes, and she could take from one envelope and, you know, borrow from one envelope or take from one envelope to pay off something else in another. But when the cash ran out, we were, we were you know, done for that month. It was a self-imposed trial. And I'll explain in just a few minutes. But you have bank loans. So easy to get a bank loan, equity loans, uh, home shops. You can go and, and take, a, take something very valuable, uh, and they'll give you, uh, I think, uh, maybe uh, 25, 30 cent on the dollar. And if you come back and, and pay it off, the high interest rate, you get that item back. But it's, it's, it's there. Medical advancements. How does how is medical advancements replace God? John, you're, you, you were a doctor. Um, well, if you get really sick, and uh, like I had uh, colon cancer. Now, 100 years ago, I'd have died from it. Um, but now, you know, they take it out and give me chemotherapy, and uh, 15 years later, I'm fine, fine a frog here. So, you know, was that God or was that man that saved my life? Yeah. And, it, and, it, and people that they depend upon medical advancements to, to yeah. for their answers instead of running to God for that. So easy to do. I'm not against medical advancements and technology. I'm not against that at all. But if it replaces us going to God and asking God to heal us. I think what you're saying is that when people rely on what hasn't happened to them yet, they think that when I get sick, 
because there's medical advancements, I'm going to be fine. That's not true. Like, you might not be fine. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Thank you. But uh, uh, just the groceries. If, I, if, if you talk to your parents, they, you, Paul, your, your mom's uh, just turned 90. Probably talk to her and she'll talk about what she could buy at the grocery stores back then as compared to today. We have a phone that's full of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but back then, did your... Our, our, because she didn't have things back then. Yeah. My, my, I remember my grandmother, they, they, would, they would grow the vegetables on the farm. They would, they would can most of them, and uh, they would have, have it in the cellar. Uh, my dad, he talked about him, they would make sauerkraut out of the, out of the cabbage, and that's, they would have the pots down in the ground, which they'd put their cabbage in, pack it full, and that's how they, they extended the life of that cabbage. Yeah. So there were things that they had to plan ahead to do, but they had to go back and depend upon God to provide the rain for the crops to grow everything. So things have changed. James 5 uh, through 11, 1, 5 through 11 says, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him that he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. But the brother of humble circumstances is, is to glory in his high position, and the rich man is to glory in his humiliation. Because like flowering grass, he, he will pass away. But the sun, <clears throat> for the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass, and its flower falls off, and the beauty of the, its appearance is destroyed. So too is the rich man in the midst of the pursuits, of his pursuits will fade away. Wisdom comes from God, but we, we must ask without any doubt. God gives wisdom generously to his children. God never expresses disapproval. Without reproach means disapproval. When we ask him for wisdom. How many times have your children, has your children come and ask you for something several times a day, this, you know, the same thing, and you say, I already gave that to you. I already did that for you. Why are you asking me again? God won't do that when we ask for wisdom. He doesn't say, I've already given you wisdom four times last week. Don't come and ask me again. No, he's, he's generous with us. He'll dish it out. He's ready there. He wants to give it to us. When I think about the power of God, it amazes me. I've watched some of these, uh, you know, Superman... Uh, all these uh, superheroes, and I can never remember a time in any movie uh, that a superhero was able to transfer his power to somebody else. Roger, can you think of anything? He's my expert on this area. Go, 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 Roger on that. No. But God can. He, can. he can give us power. He can give us His wisdom. <coughs> Why wouldn't we take advantage of that? Believers who doubt God's power and promises are double-minded and unstable. That hits hard with me. I don't want to be considered double-minded and unstable. The answer is, go to God. The purpose for wisdom in James 1, 1 to 12, is to help believers overcome trials. That's the reason for wisdom. So when we're faced with trials, pray for wisdom. That's how this is, the, in the context of this passage, is being applied. Wisdom is there to help us through trials. Now we can pray for wisdom for other areas. 
for making decisions. That's one of my prayers every day is, Lord, give me great wisdom as I make decisions today. Decisions that would be pleasing in your sight, glorifying to you, and wise. Keep me from making any decisions that, that would not be according to your will. The last one is, a poor man is in a better position to deal with trials than a rich man. That's what this, this uh, uh, is, is talking about in, in verses uh, uh, 9 through, through uh, 11 there. It's basically saying a poor man is in better position to deal with trials than a rich man. Why is it so? More experience? He doesn't have anything to rely on. Doesn't have anything to rely on. He just says, Lord, help me. Where's the rich man? And there's a tendency when if we have money, we that's our that's our solution to our problem. If you had enough money to buy a brand new car right now, your car broke down, what's the tendency to do? Is it, Lord, my car broke down. What should I do? Will you give me wisdom? Should I go and buy a new car? Should I go to this dealership or that dealership? Lord, should I buy this model car or that model car? Or would you say, oh, I'll go out and just, I have the money. I can go out and get what I want. Would you take the time to go to the Lord and say, give me the wisdom as I make this decision? If I'm not supposed to buy this car, close the door. Show me. Give me, do not give me peace about this. Any other observations from this passage? Jeff? Uh, you just hit on the first nine there. It, it struck me how that in God's way of seeing things, the, the brother of humble circumstances is in a high position. Some translations say exalted even. Okay. That's the way God sees the poor, the man who's fully having to depend on him. Yes. When, 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 but poor men cannot, they, can, they cannot depend upon God too. Oh, they can have, poor, yes. Right, that's right. But more, more likely they are going to depend upon God that's because right. of the need. That's right. Very good. The rich man is humiliated in the fact that he, he knows that his status, his money is temporary. It's fleeting. It will pass away. It's not forever. Okay. And, it, and the rich man is humiliated in that knowledge that what you have would, and what may make them think they're stable is not, is not eternal. It's, it, it's, it's only temporary. Okay. Good. We see in Paul a man whose God's power is perfected in weakness. I've just listed a few of the trials and tribulation that Paul went through. Beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received the Jews 39 lashes. What well, I understand, they, they, in Scripture, I, the Deuteronomy 25 3 said they could receive 40 lashes. I think they, re they reduced it down to 39, just trying to make sure they don't go over the 40 there. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was ship shipwrecked. A night and day I have spent in the deep. Dangers from rivers. Dangers from robbers. Dangers from my countrymen. This man was went through trials. But what's amazing in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10, he says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might lead me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weaknesses, so that that power, that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, 
with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Because he was allowed, Paul allowed God's power to work through him, to depend upon him. It's amazing. He's a, he, he's, a, he's a great person to go through, to model after. And say, Lord, allow my weaknesses to be strengths. I want to depend upon you for that. The disciple learns to grow stronger when faced with trials. What characteristics would a disciple, a learner, a pupil, display when faced with difficulties? What would you say they would they would uh, display? They're teachable. Teachable. How does that how does that uh, pan out? To be teachable, what would what would you you want to learn from, from God, from others, what what would help you. Okay. It, it quite requires a humility to to say, I don't know what to do or I don't have any answer. It's so easy to get a to get to get uh, a new item and it has uh, a bunch of moving parts and different parts to put together. Uh, I have a tendency to place the instructions off to the side. And look at it, and I, there's, I, I can figure a lot of things out. But uh, you know, my my dad had a saying when when uh, when I would try to do that. Said, "When all fails, read the instructions." You know, and I'd have to come back, be teachable. What else? Lori. Well, in that being teachable, I'm a person that asks too many questions, and so you have to trust the source. So if I ask God for help. I need to trust him and leave it with him and not question everything. And I think sometimes we have, it, it, it borders on excuses. Well, God, you know, that just doesn't seem right, so I'm going to go do such and such. So part of being teachable is you have to trust in the source and the, you know, the wisdom that you're asking for. Years ago, we had a lady that called the church, and she asked for financial help. Uh, brought the need to the to the leadership. They said, "Okay, we'll we'll uh, we'll write out a check for her uh, some of her rent, or as it, it was a uh, electric bill or something. It was I think it's in around 186 dollars, if I remember correctly. And when we do this, we we will we try to use it as an opportunity to share the gospel. <coughs> I shared the gospel with her. She professed it. To, to know and have trusted Jesus Christ for, for her salvation. Uh, she was not involved in a church. I said, you know, what we want you to do, you know, if you ever need have a need again, we want to see you involved in the church. And our policy of the church is if you come back for a, a need a second time, we have men in our church that are very uh, educated in this area. We need to sit down and take a look at your checkbook, look, look at your finances to see how we can help you on that. Her response, response to my that was, no one can deal with my checkbook better than me. She wasn't teaching. About three months later, she called Dr. Kino. And I repeated, are you, are, where are you going to church? I'm not going to church. I says, well, would you be willing to submit to some leaders Take a look at your checkbook to help you with your finances. No. She hung up. She wasn't teaching. Look at areas. Teach, the teachability creeps up uh, with me. And I, and at times I think I'm, I'm teachable and other times I'm not. Just ask Jane. <laughs> I would like to challenge you to put something into action. Force your faith to come alive. Commit to a Philippians 419 no debt cash only policy. This is my proposal to you. 
God says, and my God, Scripture says, and my God will supply all your needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That is His promise. So if we have a need, He'll supply it. Too many times we don't want to wait. We do not want to sacrifice. We're impatient. But as you, if you apply this, and it becomes a lifestyle, I believe it will help you in other areas of your life with trials that you face. Because you're going to be, you're going to see how God supplied a need financially. And you say, boy, this is exciting. And then when you're faced with another trial in a different area, you can reflect about and say, hey, God was faithful here. He's, he can, he, he, he's all powerful. I need to depend on him for this. I have some things that to, for you to consider. Ask God for wisdom without any doubt. Dealing with your finances. Lord, give me wisdom to know how to be a, to be a good steward of the money that you have blessed me with. Give me wisdom. I have no other area that I know of and maybe you can share with me if you can think of our area that we can apply something to our lives to increase our faith. We are dealing with money on a daily basis. We are purchasing things many times on a daily basis. From food to gas to, to paying a bill. It's, it's constant. We can depend upon God in this area. Have faith in Him. And it takes a no debt cash policy and totally, totally depends on him. Commit to that. No debt. No debt. Cash only. Set a monthly budget. If you haven't set a monthly budget, you have, that's, that's part of that plan. How much you want to spend? Like I said, Jane had these envelopes and they were so old she started, she didn't want them to get a new envelope, she started taping them up. You know, they start coming apart, she had to tape them on just to keep them and she had to you know, giving, food budget. She, she gave, we had a little walk around money. This is my little walk around money every month. So it's money that I took out, Jane took out, that we could spend on what we would, you know, kind of splurge a little bit. So we had, I had that in my wallet. The, uh, the walk around money. Pray that God will provide you with the best <coughs> items for the best price. When was the last time you had to buy a, an appliance? Do you say, Lord, give me wisdom as I buy this appliance? Help me to get the best appliance that will last the longest and will be the cheapest. We needed a stove. We had an electric stove, and the stove, it, it was 25 years old, it went out, had to get it now. So we started looking. We had, we had natural gas in our house. So I said, let's look at the natural gas stove. Things were $3,000. So we started looking. We started praying, Lord, provide. So we get go over to Best Buy, and they had a, 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 a floor model that someone had bought, brought it back because it had a little scratch on the top. I knew I could take a sand, buy a sandpaper, stainless steel, I could, I could bump it out. It was already it was already less than half price. So <clears throat> we get up there and uh, ask the manager to come over and say, "Hey, do you have any flexibility on this price?" He knocked off another three hundred dollars, and we ended up getting it around for I think eleven hundred dollars. But we said, "Lord, we need uh, an appliance. Would you provide it for us? The best." Appliance for the best price. Pray for these items, no matter how big or small. When you start today, I would encourage you to pray, Lord, give me wisdom that to be the, a, a, a good steward of what you have blessed me with. These are, I, I call it a self-imposed trial. This is a self-imposed because you're going to be stretched. If you don't have the money, you're going to say, Lord, we, I, I, I'm dependent upon you for this. If you stick with your no debt cash only policy. It's a self-imposed trial. Be a cheerful, save, sacrifice, and work to be debt free. It takes work, Gus. 
Many of you have done this. It takes this constant. It has to be every area of your life. We would go to ball games. I would come home from work. Jenny would have the hot dogs on the grill. We'd have to go to ball games. I would crank up the grill, put the hot dogs on, stuff them in, in bonds, wrap them up in aluminum foil. We'd put them up and we'd head to the ball ballpark. And we had our own water and, and drinks. And that's, we dealt with that. We'd sit there and, you know, that's how we did it. We never, if we go out to eat, we'd never buy drinks. They would just be too expensive. Water, water, water. They'd go around and the wait, waitress would go, what do you want water, 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 water? Why didn't you just, every, one of you just say, we all have water, you know? Because <laughs> they know. Be a cheerful giver. Learn to discern the difference between a need and a want. Take good care of your possessions and wear them out before purchasing a replacement. That's the best way of saving. It. Wear it out. Pray for peace about your purchases and open it, and for opening closed doors. It's amazing how many times the Lord has closed the door for a purchase that we wanted to have. And then last, remember how God has provided for you in the past. Can you think of any others? I know some of you have been doing this. Can you, are there any other things that, that pop up in your mind that you would do? Rick? God provided for you in the past. Thank Him for it. Excellent. Constantly be thanking God for His provision. Kathleen? When you do what you're talking about, which Rick and I have been doing since 1986 um, you sleep at night you don't have to be concerned about how am I going to pay this bill because I spent more money than what I have so you can go to bed and sleep make it a lifestyle it will filter over in your other areas of your life Jim I would just say, you know, you've got there to be a cheerful giver, but be a determined giver. Explain that. Be a, you're, you're, he said be a determined giver. Tell me. When you have your income, you give to the Lord first. He wants the first fruits. Give to Him first. Don't consider what bills I have to pay. Am I going to have enough to do that? Give be determined to give to the Lord first. And so, He will supply the rest. So are you saying you're, you're going to say, hey, I'm determined to give X percentage or X amount. Mm -hmm. yes. So you do that, you determine that and do that first so that you don't get it in the month and oh, I have this, you know, right. after. Right. Yeah. So, Gloria. Um, I'm speaking because I don't have this down path, but uh, <clears throat> the point I want to make is um, ask the Lord for creativity along with the wisdom to do this. Uh, by that I mean uh, that things were getting tight and I said, Lord, I, I don't know what to do. Uh, and he said, you know, go meet with us twice a week. You know, and I had little children at the time. Or do a, do a pantry dinner. You know, go through your pantry because we all have more stuff than we need. And before I went to the store, I'm like, I'm going to I'm going to cook up some of this stuff, you know, and it was kind of a creative, crazy meal, but, you know. Uh, so that, that's what I mean by that. Ask the Lord for creativity. When you're going through, it, it's just another form of the word wisdom, but um, especially if you have children who, who want things and maybe you can't see your way through that, you can be creative. And, and it all boils down to sacrifice. I was talking to a young girl years ago. She had just graduated from college. She was complaining about the $20,000 um, uh, school loan that she had. She was living with a grandmother. She was only paying $100 a month for rent, for everything, food and everything from her grandmother. And, and I says, I know how you can pay it off in two years. She said, I have. I said, she already had a job, a full-time job. I said, I'll get you a job in the evening after you get off of work. And, and then 75% of her money, I said, put it towards paying off your debt. She said, she had no expenses, really. 
She says, I can't do that. I said, why? She said, I don't want to give up my lifestyle. Sharon. One thing that Floyd and I did um, when we were first married, I stayed home and raised our children and homeschooled them in the whole nine yards. So that eventually ends. So when I started to go to work, we never made my money and part of the household income. We always lived off what Floyd made. So my money was extra. And it paid for, I could give you a very long list of what mm. it paid for. It was always, I say my money, but he knew what we were, it was used for both of us. Huh. Awesome. Awesome, that's great. Focus on the finish line. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trials because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. This is an extra crown that's, that, that uh, this, uh, understands other than your eternal life. The crown of life is, there's five crowns that I understand from Scripture that as believers we can earn as rewards. And this is one of those crowns. Focus on that finish line. Sometimes when you're going through a trial, it's, it's tough. But I look at the finish line. When we were working on the farm and it, and it was 90 some degrees heat, I knew that there was a cold watermelon <laughs> waiting for me mid-morning and mid-afternoon. And I, that was, I, I focused on that. And then I focused on, after I got past that second watermelon, I focused on the shower <laughs> and going to bed. That's what I looked for. The biblical principles, trials are great opportunities for uh, spiritual growth. Believe in God's power and promises, but never doubt when asking Him for wisdom to navigate your trials. He will not give us that wisdom if we doubt. Focus on the finish line, the crown of life awaits the faithful in Christ. Trials are a blessing. Name them one by one. Ask for wisdom and faith, and it will be done. Ask God for wisdom, but never, never doubt. Or He will take your prayer and throw it out. Calluses form when mild but repeated injury causes the cells of the epidermis, the outer layer of the skin, to become increasingly active, giving rise to a localized increase in tissue. The resulting hardened, thickened pad of dead skin at the surface of the, of the skin serves to protect the underlying tissue. It's a process. And that's the reason I, for this, for calluses, and as you continue working, that they build and build, continue uh, forcing yourself in this, this self-imposed trials, I would encourage you to consider that. So that it will prepare you for the difficult times, more difficult times in life. <coughs> Consider it all my joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. That the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let endurance have a perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. God wants us to lack in nothing. And when we reach that point, Go back to Paul and what he said. I am well content with my weaknesses, with insults, with persecutions. God's power is perfected in weakness. Seek his wisdom and power. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you provide trials there, that they are there for a purpose, to help us to grow closer to you, to be faithful servants of yours. Give us great wisdom to be faithful in all of our ways. In Jesus' name, amen.